This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. And here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. Our team has documented further gross human rights violations throughout the country, including widespread and horrific attacks against civilians and state-sponsored extrajudicial killings. That was Andrew Clapham, a member of the UN Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan. Details coming up. Also, conservationists welcome a long-touted global treaty to protect the oceans. Cyclone Freddy is forecast to hit Mozambique and Southern Africa a second time. And opposition to Tunisia President Kais Saeed is growing. These stories and more on African News tonight. But first, our top story, only one woman has occupied any of the top four positions in Nigeria's government since independence in 1960. Women hold just 5% of the legislative seats, one of the lowest representation rates globally. As the world celebrates International Women's Day, our reporter in Abuja looks at the low rate of female participation in Nigerian politics. Nigeria has never elected a female president, vice president, or even governor. Only a few women have served as deputy governor. In the 2023 elections, women are running for only 10% of state assembly seats, 9% of the National Assembly, 8% of the Senate, and 6% of all governorships. Hajia Ureti Kingibe won a senatorial seat representing Abuja in last month's presidential and national assembly election. She spoke to VOA about having a female president in Nigeria. It would be a dream come true, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. We have to get a transparent electoral process. Right now, the credibility and the transparency of the whole process is in great question. It's always the same thing. We prepare for these elections for four years, and at the end of it, nothing works. Hajia Kingibe, a Labour Party member, says... Corruption and the high cost of campaigns hinder women candidates. The biggest problem Nigeria has is it's generally corrupt. There's always there's a lot of challenges, violence, so many things, money, none of which I have. I have the people, but I'm not a thief. I haven't stolen any money. I haven't done any corrupt things. I don't intend to do any. So with all that amount of money flying around, there were so many people available to be bought. Africa's most populous nation has many women in leadership positions in the private sector and on the international stage. But when it comes to elected positions, they are underrepresented and often marginalized. Since 2006, there has been a plan to mandate that 35% of all elective offices be filled by women, and a federal high court in Abuja has ordered the government to comply with the plan. However, last year, 208 out of 290 lawmakers in the National Assembly voted against legislation to enact the plan. One issue for women is the fees that political parties charge for candidate nomination farms. The farms can cost thousands of dollars, pricing out many women and younger candidates. Barrister Juliet Ikanyere, who ran unsuccessfully for parliament last month, says women need to amplify their voices in the male world of politics. Some of this constitution of this party already accommodates women to come in, but we need the implementation of those policies. And only when the men adjust their mindset and give more room to women to contest and win, not just to buy forms freely and then at the end of the day, to change it with other men. Enede is a gender and media strategist and was a candidate in the 2019 elections. She says women must demand more from the political system. We as women group, we have not done enough. We have not shown enough displeasure that we are not happy about the system that particularly rejects women for no reason. Ede, who says the statistics of women in the 2023 elections were the worst in history, is calling on the government and stakeholders to create an enabling environment to encourage more women to vie for elective positions. For VOA News, from Abuja, Hilda Suka Mafuze is the African Union ambassador to the United States. 
A short time ago, she spoke with my colleague, Esther Githu Uart, about the theme for this year's International Women's Day, which is Digital All, Embrace Equality. The ambassador discussed efforts in Africa to educate and empower women and girls in the world of technology. This is an interesting theme this year where, you know, they're calling for innovation, you know, digital technology, gender equality. But how, how does, can Africa really make this a, a reality in this century, given that we have places, so many of them in the continent, that don't even have electricity? No, there's a, a lot of work, go, work going on on the continent, as we speak, uh, to ensure there's energy. And as we talk of the renewable energy at the moment, I think most of the countries, as I have realized, are working on ensuring there's electricity at each and every turn of our continent because it's the era of technology and it's the era that we are saying uh, the African countries should invest more into the infrastructure of technology to ensure the women also who are studying STEM pro programs I, I found where they will be which ensures their work out there. You know, how can Africa then uh, leverage on digital technology uh, to bring about change, especially for women? You speak more about the women here. It's our, it's our day tomorrow. And so we want to hear more about what women can do and how they can leverage on this technology. The, the good thing, the women are really ready. The women are already in that stack. They are already demanding to saying this is the digital era and the, what exactly has to be done for us is we have to be found fitting in into this era of technology. And, and in what ways, Ambassador, can you use your own position? This is a, a, a big task here for the continent. You are the U.S., the, the African Union Ambassador to the United States. Yes, yes. How can you use your position to bring about change for women in Africa? I really would want this exposure for the women, uh, for them to I identify the diaspora here, organizations, that working on issues to do with the women who have already who are already at a certain level as regards the issue of the technology that we're talking of. It's the digital era. And the digital era also will be fair to all the continent. I would want to connect the women on the continent, to connect them with the organizations that are here that are running with the issues of technology. And with that yeah. we're found we're at the same wavelength worldwide I like with other women. Fact, I like the fact that, I, because I wanted to ask you how you're engaging the, the people here in the diaspora, because like you say, they have the, the know-how, they are exposed to technology, and uh, they are still very much connected with the continent, and uh, their input is very, very important. So I'm glad you're talking about that. But let me take you back to your home country, first of all, yes. and, and let me know <laughs> how are the girls doing, because they're the future, the young people are the future of technology and advancement of their countries. I'll tell you, in my country at the moment, things are shaping up. I mean, in terms of uh, the girls are now learning in the areas of STEM, which is the, the science, technology, uh, engineering, and maths. And the girls are going into those kind of studies. And what does that mean? It means they are grappling, they are getting there in the issue of the change, the future change that we're foreseeing in these are areas that were ignored, so to say. But with the women now coming to the fore and the recognition of the women today, the women are taking that with the, the strength that they have to say, we are going to work on the STEM and the, so that we can fit into the world, which is the future change that we're saying will come through the women. Ambassador, and I think this is not only in Harare where, you know, because most cities are, <laughs> have electricity, but also in the rural areas. But I want to know if you have a personal goal that you want to achieve for the continent while you're still the African Union ambassador to the United States. The good thing with uh, the, the, the strategy that I would want to put in place is African Union has come up with uh, the Gateway Project. The pro this is a document which was put in place in 2018, and it's going to run for eight, for 10 years, up to 2028. And this one allows the women to be included in areas of 
um, financial, uh, let's talk of banks. Let me give you an example of banks. That a woman walks into the bank and is told you have no collateral security. African we we Union is working in that regard to ensure women are included into them also being able to get these these loans to be able to run their own businesses. How will you be celebrating tomorrow? Oh, it will be a beautiful day. I wish you, VOA, should come to African Union mission. We are having the younger women, professionals, who are coming together to work on the issue of making sure we are pulling others, the younger people, to say this is the direction to take. We are at a certain level at the moment as women, and we should be celebrating by tomorrow morning. And all of you should come to African Union Mission and celebrate with us. would really appreciate. That was Hilda Suka Mafuze, the African Union Ambassador to the United States. She was speaking with Esther Gitwi Uart on VOA's Africa 54 TV news show. You can watch the interview on voaafrica.com. Weather forecasters say tropical cyclone Freddy is set for a rare second hit to Mozambique and Southern Africa on Friday night. The UN monitoring station says Freddy is expected to intensify today to a tropical cyclone with wind speeds at sea averaging 110 kilometers per hour and wind gusts of about 155 kilometers per hour. The Associated Press says Freddy is expected to make landfall on Mozambique's second most populous province of Zambezia. Freddy struck eastern Madagascar last month and returned there yesterday, killing four people, including two children. Since February 11th, people have died in Madagascar and seven in Mozambique. The government of Madagascar says 15,000 people have been affected and nearly 11,000 displaced by the storm. Opposition to Tunisian President Kai Saeed appears to be growing. On Sunday, hundreds took to the streets in Tunis against his rule and called for the release of detained opposition leaders, whom he calls traitors and terrorists. On Saturday, thousands from the powerful UGTT Labour Union and Allied parties staged one of the biggest protests against him so far. Ahmed Galul, former Minister of Youth and Sports, led a delegation of opposition leaders to Washington rally uh, to rally U.S. support for a democratic transition to real democracy in Tunisia. He spoke with VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shanawi. Well, to tell you the truth, we did not receive what might be called a response. There is an expression of concern about what is happening, but there is no real policy and no real standing by democracy in our country. The USA is a strategic partner to the democratic transition in Tunisia. The democratic stakeholders in Tunisia are quite open to the USA and to the European Union. And um, the USA has invested a lot of money and a lot of training in human resources. And it is a partner in building the democratic institutions after the revolution 2011. We are aware that the West right now is facing a real danger because of the war in Ukraine. But we need also to be aware that there is a, a negative pro- propaganda against the democratic values of the West. And everybody knows what the foreign minister of the Russian, when he spoke about the double standards in regard to the Western values in democracy. And he said that they are not really defending the universal values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. I am concerned about that. And Lavrov, when he said that, he was addressing the Arab public opinion, which can be sensitive to these double standards from the West. I know that the American administration is quite capable in helping, regaining, or supporting the democracy democratic stakeholders and democratic society in Tunisia so that they can regain this so fight it for democracy in a peaceful way. Well, the U.S. has sent several senior officials to Tunisia calling President Qais Saeed to restore democracy and stop backsliding to one-man rule. However, he didn't change his course. 
what's the way out? In one of the meetings is what one European diplomat said that we are trying and we are speaking to him. So my answer was is that, well, Qais Saeed will let you say whatever you want, but he will do whatever he wants. So we need to be clear about how the democratic world, how the world can stand by democracy. What can be done is, for example, not to finance dictatorship. And that is why we had in Tunisia the first fall of the dictator of Ben Ali's regime. And that has led to the wave of the Arab Spring all around the Arab world. So the way out is only standing by universal values of human rights and saying it in blunt way that the West does not tolerate such abuses of democracy and such abuses of human rights. And the United States did not behave in such a way when there was a coup in some American Latin countries. So or the democratic world should use the same policy, same standards in regard to preserving the universality of democratic values and human rights values and the rule of law. Some experts say that the real problem in Tunisia is that there is no unity among political parties. Would a united opposition backed by the powerful labor union be able to take Tunisia back to a democratic transition? Yes, surely. Part of the problem is the fragmentation of the political parties. But we need to be aware that during the last few weeks, most, if not all, democratic political parties have gathered together in one inclusive debate, and they were about to declare the outcome of that debate. The uh, work unions also have started such process. But in order to, to block this debate process and dynamic, Kai Syed has waged a prosecution war against all his opposition, and he's put most of their leaders in prison. So right now, we don't have a fragmentation right now in Tunisia. Right now, we need a serious message towards institutions that are supporting the dictatorship of Qais Saeed, that there is still justice in the world, in the international community and and, and around the world. And if Qais Saeed has put his heavy hand over the judiciary system. There is actually a judiciary system around the world which will put these people responsible for their crimes. That was Ahmed Galoul, former Tunisian Minister of Youth and Sports, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Tourism officials in Cameroon are meeting to revamp the country's most important wildlife reserve, Waza National Park, which has suffered from terrorism, poaching and deforestation. The park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site on Cameroon's northern border with Chad and Nigeria that used to attract thousands of visitors per year. Officials say Boko Haram terrorists scared off most tourists, while poachers and illegal loggers continue to wreak havoc on the park. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Cameroon's Waza National Park, on the borders with Chad and Nigeria, is the country's most diverse wildlife reserve with lions, elephants, giraffes, antelopes and numerous species of birds. The 170,000-hectare park has been recognized since 1979 as a UNESCO World Heritage Biosphere Reserve. But the government says the number of tourists visiting Waza dropped from close to 4,000 in 2013 to less than 300 last year. Astia Kalati is a tourism official in Logon and Shari, the administrative unit in charge of Waza. She spoke to VOA via a messaging app from the northern town of Kuseri. Tailati says terrorism started harming tourism in Waza in 2013 when Boko Haram at gunpoint abducted a French family of seven who were vacationing in northern Cameroon. She says in 2014, the Nigerian Islamist group again forced their way into a Chinese construction camp in Waza and abducted 10 road engineers. Boko Haram released the hostages after some weeks, but Tailati says the attacks scared off tourists. 
Talati says Cameroon's tourism officials are meeting in the region this week to discuss how to attract tourists back to the park. The militants' attacks on farms and shops, including some that depended on tourism, forced youths in the area to turn to poaching and illegal logging to make a living. Officials say improved security on both sides of the borders has reduced the threat from terrorists with no large-scale attacks reported in the area for more than a year. But officials say poachers and illegal loggers continue to destroy the park. The governor of Cameroon's far north region, Mijiyawa Bakari, spoke to VOA by messaging up from the region's capital, Marua. He says about 70 poachers and illegal loggers were arrested at Waza National Park this week. Bakari says those arrested are Cameroonians, Nigerians and Chadians who kill animals in the park, harvest wood from the park for charcoal and sell the wood and game to neighboring countries like Chad and Nigeria. Bakari says they have created local militias to assist ranchers and troops in protecting the park. The head of the European Union delegation to Cameroon, Philippe Van Damme, says restoring the park would bring a multitude of benefits to the area. He spoke Tuesday to Cameroon Radio Television. La protection de nature, c'est pas un luxe, mais c'est effectivement un investissement. Van Damme says protecting Waza National Park will stabilize the environment and climate, create jobs for several hundred unemployed youths, and bring in revenue from tourism. He says Cameroon and the European Union are evaluating what is needed to protect, redevelop, and bring back to life the park, which was devastated by terrorism poaching and deforestation. Van Damme, who took a group of five EU ambassadors to the park this week, said reviving it would also reduce poverty and inequality in the region. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. A new report by UNICEF says acute malnutrition among pregnant and breastfeeding mothers has increased by 25% in the past two years. The agency attributes the problem to fighting in Ukraine, which has caused a rise in food prices. UNICEF surveys looked at 10 countries and two in the Middle East and South Asia, including Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan. The report says girls and women affected by malnutrition and stunting increased from about 5.5 million in 2020 to nearly 7 million in 2022. The UN recommends increased nutritional assistance and supplying fortifications to highly consumed basics such as flour, cooking oil, and salt. It also recommends improved access to nutritional services, prenatal clinics, and supplements, some which are not affordable. Globally, UNICEF says 51 million children under two years old are affected by malnutrition, a problem that exacerbates mortality rates and complications during birth. And with that, we wrap up this edition of Africa News Tonight. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Baro, and our engineer, Bob Bass, thanks for choosing the Voice of America. Maxwell, host of Music Time in Africa. Join me every Saturday and Sunday for an hour of awesome African music. Wake up, dance this music. Like to stay on top of new music trends? Breakout artists? New releases? Maybe you just love the classic styles and artists of the past. 